this is the section where we talk about everything else in the chest that can happen. Um, so we're going to start. So that's the topic right there, zebras of the chest. So I'm going to talk about um, thymic epithelial tumors and uh, non small cells that are nonetheless noroendocrine tumors, so carcinoids of the lung and large cell noroendocrine tumors of the lung for a brief period. And what these all have in common is that they're rare. So I've shown here the annual incidence per 100,000. So for thymoma, it's 0.13 to 0.15. And then thymic carcinoma is an even rarer subtype of thymic epithelial tumors, representing less than 1 to 5 percent of all thymic epithelial tumors. So for uh, carcinoid tumors of the lung, the incidence is 1.35 per uh, 100,000. Um, they represent uh, atypical and typical carcinoid of the lungs. When we're talking about well-differentiated norendocrine tumors, represent 30 percent of well-differentiated norendocrine tumors. Most of them are in the, in the GI tract. Large cell norendocrine tumors of the lung are 2 to 3 percent of resected lung cancers. All of these illnesses are best approached by surgery. The prognosis is very different. The best prognosis is seen for thymomas and for typical carcinoids. Then we've got thymic carcinomas have a distinctly worse prognosis relative to thymomas. Atypical carcinoids are worse than typical. And then large cell norendocrine has a pretty abysmal prognosis. Um, I show here the first line chemotherapy response rate. So thymomas are pretty responsive to chemotherapy, the most responsive on this list, less so thymic carcinomas. Carcinoids of the lung, for as far as uh, traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy, are very chemotherapy insensitive. And then large cell norendocrine comes in at about what we see of non small cells. It's, well, it's a norendocrine tumor, it's not as chemosensitive as small cell. Importantly, for purposes of putting together a talk, prospective randomized studies guiding us in standard of care for these, there are none for any of these illnesses. So they have that in common, too. So starting with thymic epithelial tumors. These are tumors that are derived from epithelial cells of the thymus. Um, there, however, may be a lymphocyte element that may actually predominate, but those are not the neoplastic cells. The neoplastic cells are the epithelial cells. Within the anterior mediastinum, these are the most common tumors, the thymic epithelial tumors. You can also get within the thymus itself lymphomas, germ cell tumors, and carcinoid tumors, those are not considered thymic epithelial cells because they have a different neoplastic um, cell from which they're derived. Thymic epithelial tumors, TETs, I'll call them now, affect both sexes equally, most common in the fifth and sixth decade. A third are asymptomatic at detection, a third are causing localized symptoms, and a third of them are discovered when a patient presents with myasthenia gravis. There is an increased risk of secondary malignancies associated with uh, thymic epithelial tumors between one and a half to four times that of patients without these. So um, thymic epithelial tumors are classified by the WHO grade. Um, these are the gradings for a thymoma. You can have type A, which um, looks almost just like the medullary portion of a normal thymus, um, whereas the type B looks more like the cortical thymus, with B1 being the most differentiated to B3 being the least differentiated. And then you can have type AB, which is a mix of the medullary and the cortical subtype. And I've included here some of the other names that these have been given. There's lots of different nomenclature for the subtypes of thymoma, but the WHO classification is the most standard. There used to be a WHO classification for type C, and that was thymic carcinoma, but that is taken out of the thymoma classification, and it is now its own entity, thymic carcinoma. The most common staging system has been the Masoka staging system, um, where stage one is completely encapsulated, a thymic epithelial tumor that's completely within a capsule. Stage two is where there's some capsular, transcapsular invasion, and stage B, uh, stage 2B is when there's um, uh, through the capsule into the surrounding fatty tissue. Stage three is where the, the tumor is invading into neighboring organs, either the great vessels, and either the surrounding structures without the great vessels or subtype B without, with the, the great vessel invasion. Then there's stage four. Um, for thymomas, it's rare that you get hematogenous dissemination. So usually stage four is by pericardial or pleural dissemination. But within thymic carcinoma, you can more commonly have um, lymphatic or hematogenous metastases and have more distant metastases with stage four disease. Um, there is a new proposed um, ITMIG, um, the, you know, that's the, the thymus study group, and ISLAC epithel, or TET staging system um, that's shown here. And actually, because the prognosis is similar for stage one and two uh, thymomas, those are all lumped into stage one in this newly proposed staging system, with then stage two being invading to the pericardium, and then stage three still invading into the adjacent organs, and stage four still with distant metastases.
Um, so the survival and the prognosis of thymic thymomas are determined um, very much so by stage, and I had just mentioned that stage one and stage two are similar. So those are, these are survivals for resected um, specimens um, by Masoka stage. And then the WHO categorization also matters. Type A is the least common but has the best um, prognosis um, with almost guaranteed long-term survival followed by AB, and then it goes down by D differentiation within the B subcategory, with thymic carcinoma having the worst long-term survival. So what's the difference between thymic and thymic carcinoma? Well, the distinction is based on the histologic appearance. Thymomas, when you look at them under the microscope, are very bland appearing and don't appear particularly malignant, but they can still be invasive and or metastatic. Thymic carcinomas, on the other hand, look like cancers under the microscope and, in fact, can have its own histologic subtype. Squamous cell carcinomas of the thymus are the most common thymic carcinoma, and I've listed some other possibilities. Um, you can have um, norendocrine tumors of the thymus as well. One of the interesting things about thymomas is that they're associated with perineoplastic disorders. Um, the thymus is an immune organ, and it therefore stands to reason that derangements of that would cause perineoplastic disorders of the immune system. So myasthenia gravis is the most common. It's seen in 30 to 50 percent of patients with thymoma. Um, other sometimes seen perineoplastic disorders are pure red cell aplasia, hypogammaglobulinemia, and um, some others are listed there. So myasthenia gravis, what is that? That is an antibody-mediated T-cell-dependent autoimmune attack against the acetylcholine receptors of the postsynaptic neuromuscular junction. Practically, this results in weakness of the ocular, bulbar, limb, and respiratory muscles. Patients with myasthenia um, subclinically, if, if, they're, if they are stressed, can go into a myasthenic crisis, which um, evolves into respiratory insufficiency. This could be precipitated by surgery. So any patient you think may have a thymoma, you want to assess them for the possibility of myasthenia gravis before taking them to surgery, and if you're worried, you need to get a neurology consultation. So 10 to 15 percent of patients who present with myasthenia gravis are found to have an underlying thymoma. So for thymoma, the best treatment is a complete surgical resection. The prognosis is quite excellent for early stage disease. However, relapses, recurrences can occur several years later, so prolonged follow-up is necessary. When these do metastasize, they usually metastasize to the pleura, so-called drop metastases. And here we have a, a curve showing you that total resection is the best um, outcome for patients with thymoma. Those who are in inoperable or have subtotal resections have a much less good survival. One of the controversies of thymomas has been whether or not patients should get radiation following their, um, their surgery for thymoma. Um, and it's pretty clear that patients in whom the tumor is completely encapsulated, stage one disease, should not get any postoperative radiation. Um, a little bit hazier for patients where there is capsular invasion present who are stages two through four. Um, and the recommendation in the NCCN guidelines currently is to consider postoperative radiation. And those are for R0 resections. If it's an R1 or an R2 resection, there's no question that those patients should get postoperative radiation therapy. A part of the problem is um, what's shown over here on the right, and that is a meta-analysis looking at post-op versus no post-op radiation. These are all retrospective. These are not prospective randomized studies, but looking at uh, retrospective looks at post-operative versus no post-operative radiation. And there really hasn't been any demonstrated benefit um, in, in patients with thymomas who get post-operative radiation. One of the largest series is this Japanese database of over 2,000 patients. And when they looked at patients with resected disease, within thymic carcinoma, they found for stage three, but not for stage two, there was an advantage in those patients getting postoperative radiation, but they did not see such an advantage for patients with thymoma. Um, there was a SEER um, analysis of patients with stage 3 disease um, who were resected for th their thymomas. This study did, this large database did show an overall advantage to patients in terms of disease-specific survival who got postoperative radiation. Um, it did not affect overall survival, but did affect disease-specific overall survival. So this just sort of adds to the controversy. How about chemotherapy and thymic tumors? Why would one do this? Well, if patients have advanced disease, you may want to use systemic therapy to palliate those patients. Um, but it can also improve outcomes for patients with locally advanced um, but surgically resectable disease. It can actually convert inoperable patients to operable patients and thereby achieve, improve the ability to achieve a complete remission, which is the best predictor of good outcome for thymic epithelial tumors. And it can also improve the efficacy of definitive radiation. 
Thymic epithelial tumors are quite chemotherapy responsive, and most of these studies have looked at combination chemotherapies using platinum-based chemotherapies. So here we see response rates of 50 to 90 percent. The two LEMA studies, so that's looking at carboplatinum paclitaxel um, prospectively, and they divided up whether the patients had thymomas or thymocarcinomas. Not all the studies divided this up. So for carboplatin paclitaxel, the response rate was 43 percent, not quite as good as what we tended to see with the other platinum regimens. So I do think that um, PAC remains the standard of care for thymoma. But carboplatin and paclitaxel is one of the few combinations that has been looked at specific, specifically in thymic carcinoma, where in the LEMA study the response rate was 22 percent, and another small study, all these studies are small, um, retrospective of carboplatin and paclitaxel, the response rate was 25 percent. So that is a list in the NCCN guidelines as the preferred regimen for thymic carcinoma. One of the interesting things about chemotherapy um, in thymic epithelial tumors is that the response rates are even higher if it's done in earlier stage disease, localized disease, um, and it can improve the ability to achieve a pathologic complete response rate or to achieve a complete resection. And these are a series of studies looking at chemotherapy induction for surgically resectable thymoma. If you give chemotherapy and the patient is still not a candidate for a complete resection, then there is a rationale for using definitive radiation therapy. This is an ECOG study of 26 patients who had unresectable thymomas who got two to four cycles of cisplatin, adriamycin, and cyclophosphamide. Um, and this was followed by 54 gray of radiation and then some additional chemotherapy. Response rate was 70 percent, and there was a five-year failure-free survival of 54 percent. So patients who cannot be addressed with surgery can still have a good outcome with radiation. So for relapsed thymomas beyond first-line platinum-based chemotherapy, there are additional regimens that have been shown to be useful. Pemetrexid had a 30 percent response rate in the 16 patients um, with thymoma um, versus 0 percent response rate in thymic carcinoma. Um, thymomas can be Octrea scan positive, and for such patients, um, standostatin or octreotide can be a useful therapy with a response rate of 30 percent. Sunitinib has actually shown better utility in thymic carcinoma than thymoma, and I'll talk more about that recently. Um, mTOR inhibitors have shown some efficacy, and there's a study of gem capecitabine that showed a 40 percent response rate. So some of the differences between thymic carcinoma and thymoma. Thymic carcinomas um, have a high predilection to expressing CD117, a proto-oncogene of CKIT, whereas thymomas usually do not, and that's one way to differentiate. Less than 10 percent of thymic carcinomas actually have CKIT activating mutations. Um, and this is more likely if the tumor stain positive for CD117. This is important to know because there are case reports of such patients responding to imotinib, sunitinib, or serafinib if they have KIT mutations. Another interesting aspect, um, pembrolizumab has been looked at in a phase two study of 23 patients with thymic carcinoma, and the response rate was 24 percent. Now in early phase one studies in thymoma patients, there was some fatal toxicity seen due to um, autoimmune diseases for patients with thymomas. So it's not, there, there's no real wealth of data for using it in thymomas, and, and I've been cautioned by those who have done it that it's not the best idea. Um, I did want to show my one patient, though. It's, it's rare to find these KIT mutations, but when you find them, boy, it's a cool thing. So this is a patient of mine with thymic carcinoma who had diffuse lung nodules, and I initially put him on sunitinib because there's better phase two data in, in aggregate for sunitinib. Um, and if you see, the, there's a, a pleural base nodule on the right and one next to the heart on the left. So that was in March before sunitinib, and then um, this is in June, the very first scan. Afterwards, you see that those nodules have gotten smaller. Unfortunately, this patient was very unable to tolerate sunitinib, so I did take him off of it and allowed the not I didn't allow, but they did grow back. The nodules grew back, and we see that in August of 2017. So then I transitioned to imotinib, which he's tolerated much better, and then we see his most recent scan right there with, again, a response to imotinib. So satisfying response to a targeted treatment. So this is the treatment algorithm for, um, for thymic epithelial tumors. So these present as anterior mediastinal masses. Um, you can often tell that they're thymomas just by looking at them, and in fact, if that's the case, they should be surgically resected without bothering to do a tissue biopsy because the attempt to do so can see the pleural space. Um, if there is um, invasion present, then you can consider postoperative radiation. If no invasion, then lifelong follow-up, again, because these can have late recurrences. Um, if the tumor is not considered resectable, then you do need to biopsy it, and it's reasonable to do induction chemotherapy where you can have a high response rate and can convert these patients to surgical, which is what you should do if that's the case, and if not, they should get definitive radiation if they're not metastatic. So now heading on to lung uh, neuroendocrine tumors. 
Um, so these fall into two categories, low grade versus high grade. Within the low grade category, we have typical and atypical carcinoids. High grade, we have small cell versus large cell. Um, so what percentage of, two, of lung tumors of these, just one to two percent for the low grade, um, more common for the small cell and not so common for the large cell. Um, these all share immunohistochemical staining characteristics for chromogranins, synaptophysin, and, and NCAM. Um, the size of the cells determines it, obviously, for small cell, small, large cell, large, typical and atypical carcinoid, small to medium. The mitotic rate and the KI-67 is what helps our pathologists distinguish which, whether these are low grade versus high grade. There's a clear association with smoking for the high grade, not for typical carcinoid, and it's a little bit unclear for atypical carcinoid. Um, the patients with the higher grade diseases tend to be more likely metastatic at diagnosis, which makes sense. The higher grade are also more responsive to traditional platinum-based chemotherapy with platinum etoposide. Early stage um, resectable as a matter of course for low grade and for large cell norendocrine. And sometimes you can catch a small cell early enough that it makes sense. And then for small cell, you would do PCI, but not for the others. So these are just pictures of what they all look like. Um, so carcinoid tumors, these are derived from the enterochromaffin or Kolchinsky cells, usually in the foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Um, there is an increasing incidence over the past decade, probably from increased detection. They are found incidentally in quite a few autopsies, half to 1% of autopsies, mostly in the small intestine. About 25 to 30% of these low-grade NETs are pulmonary primaries, and there is um, a minority of these are associated with um, MEN1 syndrome. Um, so these can also be associated with perineoplastic syndromes. You can get um, a secretion of vasoactive peptides causing serotonin syndrome is the most common, carcinoid syndrome with diarrhea, flushing, and wheezing. Um, carcinoid crisis can be life-threatening, and IV octreotide can prevent this. Um, and then carcinoid heart disease, valvular lesions. This occurs late in the disease course, about 20 to 70 percent of patients with metastatic disease. You can use blood and urine markers to monitor um, efficacy of treatment and to help make the diagnosis. Urinary 5-HIAA, that's a breakdown product of serotonin, has high specificity but not, not a very good sensitivity. Um, chromogranin A is a tumor marker we often use to track these patients to see how they're doing in terms of their disease burden. Um, imaging is important in this disease, um, and we can go back to our unclear medicine to determine whether or not the patients have metastatic disease. Octrea scan has been the most commonly used with 80 to 90 percent sensitivity and can likely help predict the response to octreotide. But lately, there's been the more sensitive gallium dotatate scan that has improved resolution, shorter scanning time, and a higher binding affinity for somatostatin receptors type 2. Also, MIBG scan can be useful, and that's an analog of an amine precursor taken up by the chromaffin cells and can be useful for or MIBG-directed treatments. Bone scan can be useful for bone mets. PET-CT scan in these low-grade norendocrine tumors may not be very effective because they're not very metabolically active often. So octreotide, that's an analog of somatostatin which interferes with the release of neurotransmitters through activation of membrane receptors, has a pretty short half-life, but fortunately there's an LAR version that lasts for three to four weeks. In patients with carcinoid syndrome, there's a symptomatic response in 80 percent of patients. But both of these, the octreotide form, uh, the, the LAR octreotide in the PROMED study and also lanreotide, another somatostatin analog, have both been shown to have improved progression-free survival relative to placebo in patients with well-differentiated gastroenteropathic pancreatic low-grade norendocrine tumors. So many of us extrapolate that information into the lung space and treat these patients with, um, with octreotide or lanreotide. Other studies that have been done in GI neuroendocrine tumors that we can extrapolate, so there is an initial response rate of streptozosin and doxorubicin of 69 percent, but that has not been reproduced in other studies. I think most of us have shied away from using cytotoxic chemotherapy in these low-grade neuroendocrine tumors. There was a study showing a progression-free survival benefit to sinitinib versus placebo, and then there's some promising results and response rate for the combination of capecitabine and, and temozolomide. Everolimus has been evaluated in these uh, diseases in the radiant studies. Radiant 2 and radiant 3 were mostly the GI primaries, but radiant 4 has actually distinguished itself um, by being one of the studies that has 30% uh, of a lung cohort. And so this has gotten the only approved drug for pulmonary-based uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and that's Everolimus at 10 milligrams a day, where the PFS was 11 months versus 3.9 months for patients with placebo, and a trend toward an overall survival benefit. Other treatments that you can use for carcinoids, liver-directed therapies, frequently these tumors metastasize to the liver, and you can use hepatic transcatheter arterial embolization or chemoembolization, and then there's yttrium radioembolization, targeted radionuclide therapy, and that's where the MIBG scanning can come in useful. And then more recently, peptide receptor radiotargeted therapy with either yttrium or lutetium. Um, there's concern for low counts and renal toxicity, 
but there was recently published in the New England Journal the Netter One study, and this was a study um, of 229 patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine advanced tumors that were progressive, somatostatin receptor positive, and they received um, lutetium dotatate every um, eight weeks times four, along with their octreotide, and they had a dramatically improved progression-free survival that was statistically significant and an improved response rate, 18 percent versus 3 percent. Um, it looks like there's a survival advantage, but because that was an interim early analysis, that actually did not achieve statistical significance, but it looks pretty impressive to look at the overall survival curve. So that's in the GI tumors. There is a phase two study of lutetium done in lung tumors, 34 patients, where you see um, the response rates are better for typical carcinoid and the disease control rate than they are for atypical carcinoid, only 34 patients overall. So now just jumping to large cell neuroendocrine, not much to say about that. This is an older version of the NCCN guidelines. I had a harder time even finding large cell neuroendocrine in the current guidelines, but basically it refers you to that for non-small cell lung cancer. However, when, it's, when it comes to using chemotherapy for large cell neuroendocrine, um, there are studies showing that losing a small cell-based regimen actually is more effective. So platinum etoposide is actually more effective than non-small cell regimens. These do seem to have a worse prognosis. Um, when I showed you the adjuvant, the adjuvant data earlier, large cell neuroendocrine was one of the things to consider when, whether, or not you're using, whether or not it's a high risk factor for 1B disease. Um, but the role of adjuvant chemotherapy is unclear. Um, there's actually a phase three study ongoing um, in Japan of cisplatin and arena tecan versus cisplatin and etoposide. But these are two studies. There's a very small study on the left showing that patients with large cell neuroendocrine who got adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery did better. But then this very large data set on the right um, of two, 234 patients, this was a retrospective, showed that patients didn't seem to do any better if they got adjuvant chemotherapy. So the jury's still out how much we're benefiting these patients. And those are the zebras.